Fantastic. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, good day, and uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. You've connected with the webinar on subnational adaptation finance as coordinated by the Adaptation Pipeline Accelerator. Uh, my name is James Venner, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm the Climate and Cities Technical Specialist with UNDP and UN Habitat. Along with my colleague, Muye Chambuera, we will be moderating this session. Uh, we have a very informative and an interesting agenda, we hope, as well as a very full agenda. Uh, so I'm happy to jump right in. But before I introduce our first speakers, uh, we have a couple of quick housekeeping issues I just wanted to inform everybody about. Um, all presentations will be available on the events page. Um, the webinar is being recorded. The webinar series is supported by the Adaptation Pipeline Accelerator or APA initiative which seeks to ramp up adaptation finance flows, bringing together governments, public and private financiers, as well as other stakeholders around adaptation priorities for in developing countries. And we hope to have a very rich discussion that's uh, interactive. So please, if you have any questions, please type them in the, um, the Q&A or the chat box, and we will either get to them during the Q&A session, or I encourage the participants, the panelists online to submit answers uh, as we go. Uh, we'll either get to the comments uh, right away or in the Q&A section. So I'd like to begin by uh, introducing our first speakers, Jennifer Barmore and Sreen Kitsaka Katadam, and I apologize profusely for my pronunciations, which are horrible, uh, from UNDP and UN Habitat, which are the two uh, UN agencies that are co-organizing this webinar. And I'd like to invite them to open this webinar. Uh, Jennifer is the head of uh, climate strategies and policy at UNDP. She plays a deputy role of uh, UNDP's climate hub, climate hub, and she oversees and coordinates the rollout of UNDP's Climate Promise. The Climate Promise is a corporate effort to support countries on NDCs and the delivery of the Paris Agreement, as well as a portfolio in over 120 countries and territories related to connecting global policy proce processes with national action on the ground. Serene is a program management officer in climate change at UN Habitat. She has a background in environmental law, specializing in integrating uh, adaptation with urban resilience and sustainable development into policy strategies and plans. Serene is also lead of the UN Habitat flagship program, RISA, Resilient Settlements for the Urban Poor. And with that, I'd like to uh, turn off my microphone and uh, Jenny, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, James. And good morning, afternoon, evening, colleagues. It's wonderful to join you uh, this morning. And it's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of UNDP and our co-organizers, UN Habitat, to what promises to be an exciting and informative webinar. Um, as James mentioned today, we put together a distinguished panel of speakers um, on the critical topic of financing adaptation at the subnational level. Uh, as you mentioned, this is the fifth webinar in a series organized by the Adaptation Pipeline Accelerator. Uh, the APA, which was launched by the Secretary General last year, uh, is, aims to bring further political momentum to accelerating the scale up of financing toward adaptation priorities. And UNDP has been working alongside other partners, such as the NDC Partnership and the GCF, uh, supporting the initiative and providing direct support to countries, while also sharing experience and knowledge to define and drive finance towards priorities identified in NAPs and NDCs, which we will be discussing here today. Today, we'll specifically be exploring the opportunities available, as well as the key issues and challenges related to mobilizing finance for adaptation at the subnational level. So talking about cities, towns, and regions. This webinar, as, as James mentioned, has been coordinated jointly by UNDP and UN Habitat, reflecting this strong ongoing partnership between the two agencies on climate change uh, and, and subnational action. So I will start with a bit of a quick context setting, and then I'll pass to my colleague Serene from UN Habitat to dive a bit deeper into the latest trends and advancements uh, we are seeing on urban issues and climate change, both from the political outcomes at COP as well as the landscape uh, in countries. So when it comes to climate change, we know that the stakes are high. Uh, last year was the hottest year on record. 2024 is already shaping up to be a hotter one. And we're already seeing climate impacts across uh, the world widespread and devastating. Uh, we saw the global stock take at COP28, uh, our global report card on where we are collectively 
in addressing the climate crisis tell us that we're still severely off track. We know we need to make drastic and urgent cuts in emissions to stay on pathways that keep warming below 1.5 degrees. And at the same time, the warming that's already locked in and leading to a number of extreme uh, events and, and shifts in, in weather, uh, the race to build adaptive capacity and resilience is equally important to the race to reduce emissions. And we also know that cities and municipalities are on the front lines. Urban emissions were estimated between 67 and 72% of the global share in 2020, uh, which was up from 62% in 2015. And urbanization is also on the rise uh, with 68% of global population projected to be living in urban settings by 2050. Cities also bear the brunt of climate impacts with over 800 million people in low elevation coastal cities most at risk of sea level rise. At the same time, we do have a pathway and that's the Paris Agreement. We have a pathway to address this crisis. NDCs and NAPs are both critical uh, to drive the Paris Agreement agenda, defining nationally, uh, national targets uh, both on, on mitigation and adaptation and to help reach the global goals uh, and raise climate ambition. While at the same time, these are guiding adaptation responses and including in uh, specifically included in, in urban areas and at the subnational level. Uh, we've seen that through these processes, countries are continuing to recognize the need to prioritize climate actions at the subnational level. And actually a recent UNDP analysis um, saw that newly submitted NDCs indicated 81% of NDCs contained enhanced levels of subnational ownership and inclusion compared to earlier versions. Now, UNDP's Climate Promise, which is our, our corporate initiative to support countries on NDCs and, and deliver on the Paris Agreement, supported 85% of all developing countries to enhance their NDCs in the last revision cycle. And we continue to support implementation of these NDCs. We've seen a sharp increase in partner governments' prioritization of subnational and urban climate action. The Climate uh, Promise is now active in delivering subnational actions in 55 countries. UNDP is also supporting over 50 countries on NAPs or national adaptation plans, where we see urban adaptation and strengthening planning capacity at the subnational level playing an increasingly important role. As countries move towards implementing their NDCs and NAP priorities, the topic of subnational adaptation finance, will be, which we'll discuss in the session today, is particularly timely. We see countries already taking action to engage cities and municipalities in their NAPs. For example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, UNDP supported four municipalities to develop mechanisms, tools, and approaches to enhance adaptation investments. In Bhutan, UNDP supporting the government to develop an urban resilience project in the capital, which will be the first NAP priority project to be financed. So we are seeing progress. And we know when we'll hear uh, further today, um, other examples of, of such progress, we know we need to continue to scale up. As we look ahead, the next two years will be critical in ensuring that we shift towards this 1.5 degree pathway and respond to the impending impacts. Once again, countries are expected to enhance their NDC ahead of COP30 and raise ambition. Uh, and as UNDP is gearing up to help countries in this th third revision cycle, um, we were leaning on something that we've learned um, in particular from the, the first uh, effort and, and, our, and our support to countries on NDCs, that this ambition and the need to raise uh, ambition and align with this 1.5 pathway is intricately intertwined with the implementation of NDCs. We, can have stronger, we can't have stronger NDCs if we're not able to implement the targets that we've already put forward. And we see very clearly that the biggest barrier to implementation is finance. Um, but we also see that there continues to be a lack of access to particularly subnational climate finance, um, which is a critical, critical obstacle. In 2019, IID estimated that less than 10% of climate finance committed from international climate funds was reaching local level activities. So we know we need stronger tools, stronger financial mechanisms, enabling environments to scale up subnational climate finance and deliver on these targets put forward by NDCs and NAPs. Uh, and so today we have the opportunity to dry, drill down on this topic, on looking at adaptation finance at the subnational level, including increasing financial autonomy, mobilizing revenue, attracting investment and donor funding, and increasing access to localized data to inform these investment decisions.
So as I said, this promises to be an exciting and an informative webinar. We really uh, hope uh, you actively uh, engage and participate and we appreciate you uh, spending the time with us this morning. So I wish you all a productive webinar and I'm pleased to pass uh, over to uh, my colleague from UN Habitat, Sarin. Thank you so much, Jenny. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much also, James, for um, inviting us to this uh, very critical um, webinar. So on behalf of UN Habitat, I would like to say welcome as well to the fifth Adaptation Pipeline Accelerator webinar series. It is an absolute pleasure to do this together with UNDP to cover, organize it, and dive today into the issues of adaptation finance at subnational level. As uh, Jenny already alluded, a couple of key points on the finance paradox that we are facing, the um, discrepancy between adaptation and mitigation finance, the discrepancy between national finance, climate finance, and what actually arrives on the, on the ground on the local or subnational level. Um, I would like to actually use the time to speak briefly on the recent advantage, uh, advances at COP28 in Dubai, where you have it at a um, really um, critical role and how it ties back into subnational adaptation finance. So, as Jenny already touched base, um, climate action right now is a defining moment. It was clear during the global stock tech synthesis report we received a red carpet. We are significantly off track. We, if we wish to achieve 1.5 as, um, as a target for the Paris Agreement. Countries need to explore every tool, every resource at their disposal. If we hope to meet this ambitious target and the Paris Agreement, and we must bring partners at all levels of governments, as well as the private sector, civil societies, academia, communities, to face actually this momentum. So at COP in December, the need for voicing subnational issues was made very clear during the second ministerial meeting on urbanization climate change, which convened over 60 line ministers from the urban sectors. That is unusual. Usually, your ministers invited, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Finance, go to COP. But this was the voice of the urban line ministers. 200 local leaders, over 1,000 participants. This meeting confirmed the importance of multi level climate action to achieve the Paris Agreement, to accelerate. This multi-level approach is critical to enable a stronger cross-sectoral integrated approach to better equip local governments and cities to respond to the climate crisis. UN Habitat, along with UNDP with UN and the University of Southern Denmark, recently completed an analysis of the most um, recently submitted NDCs, the 194 NDCs, to determine the level of urban content to better understand the state of urban climate action actually anchored in those NDCs. And the study also explored where countries are highlighting climate needs and possible climate solutions in urban areas and give an idea where subnational climate finance would need to be prioritized. So as an example of that finding, we determined two thirds of the 194 NDCs contain a moderate or strong level of urban content, with the percentage of NDCs containing strong urban content increased greatly from 14% back in 2017 to now 26% in 2023. So moreover, the vast majority of NDCs identify requests for funds. That's 141 NDCs out of 194. Yet only 26 NDCs include specific requests at urban level for finance. So clearly, mobilizing climate finance is a central message for most NDCs. But there's a disconnect between the need for finance and where it needs to go, as your local governments are often your first responders to the climate crisis. So we launched a results, these results in Dubai, and I expect you to publish the full report in May. And we are looking forward to share that also with you, of course, as well. At COP, UN Habitat, together with Bloomberg and the COP28 presidency, co chaired the very first local climate action summit that brought forward a joint outcome statement on urbanization and the launch of the CHAMP initiative for climate action. So, CHAMP, if you haven't heard yet, is the Coalition for High Ambition Multi Level Climate Action, is a commitment that national governments by now, over 72 countries that have adopted to engage subnational governments in planning, 
finance, implementation, and monitoring of NDCs and other climate strategies. So together, these reasons at the room continue to help and move the needle to place local action, cities, and organization at the core of the climate reform. So and with that, I welcome you to the webinar. I'm very happy to hear also of the decisions that are coming up for me. And I'm really curious to hear also of your interventions and your questions for this webinar. And I'm really grateful um, for this invitation to be here. So back to you, James. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Serene and, and uh, Jennifer, for uh, kickstarting our webinar. And thank you for the inspiring words. Um, as you'll see in the chat box, I, I'd like to warmly welcome all the participants from around the world. This is a very diverse group, and I'd like to speak quickly about the agenda today. Um, today, we'll be hearing next from uh, three experts from CPI, UNCDF, and the City Gap Fund. And this will be followed by uh, three country speakers on the ground talking about their experiences and their recommendations from Bangladesh, Kenya, and Rwanda. And as many on the call are aware, there was some ominous data in the latest adaptation gap report. UNEP noted that the adaptation finance gap stands now between 194 and $366 billion per year, with adaptation finance needs in developing countries likely to be 10 to 18 times as great as finance flows. And they drilled down deeper and found that between 2017 and 2021, the adaptation projects focusing on local communities only accounted for about 17% of climate financing. So we have greater clarity on what we're, where we're working towards, but uh, lack the delivery mechanisms to get there. So this is the premise at the heart of why we decided to do this webinar today, to inform and exchange ideas on various adaptation financing efforts as well as opportunities at the subnational level. And next, it's my pleasure to welcome three distinguished speakers offering unique expertise and experience um, in this space. Um, I, I'll kindly ask all of our speakers to, to do their best to limit their presentations to uh, eight minutes due to time limitations. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Morgan Richmond. Morgan leads the Adaptation and Resilience Workstream at the Climate Policy Initiative, or CPI. She leads analysis and support for adaptation-relevant financial instruments developed under CPI's Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance and supports the adaptation work for the Catalytic Climate Finance Facility. Morgan will be setting the scene for us today with the latest data and trends on urban adaptation finance, as well as presenting an overview on the latest tools and resources available. And with that, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Morgan. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful. Thanks, James. And let me quickly share my screen. Great. OK. I presume that folks can see my screen. Perhaps a thumbs up. Yes, great. OK, so thank you all. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to being a part of this discussion. As James previewed, I'll briefly set the scene around financing adaptation at the subnational level. We'll capture a brief snapshot of the latest data and trends in this space, highlight some resources available through the Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, CCFLA, for which CPI Climate Policy Initiative is a secretariat. And then I'll close with just one example of an opportunity in this space to highlight the kind of financing that's happening now in urban adaptation finance. So first, to set the scene uh, regarding current flows of capital to urban adaptation, in CPI's Global Landscape of Climate Finance, released in the fall of 2023, we track global climate finance flows across 2021-22 and find that average annual climate finance flows reached almost $1.3 trillion in 2021-22 on average, nearly doubling compared to 2019-2020 levels. But this increase was primarily driven by a significant acceleration in mitigation finance up more than $400 billion from 1920 to $1.15 billion in 21-22, and in the midst of that growth, adaptation finance continues to lag. We tracked $63 billion in 21-22 annually across the globe, and um, that's the red box around the $63 billion that you can see. And as you'll see on the slides that follow, of that total $63 billion, just a fraction of that is flowing to cities, as I think is has been previewed by others on this call. 
with that context in mind, as this audience is acutely aware and as the other speakers have already highlighted, while the limited volume of finance flowing to cities is concerning, particularly in the context of the significant risks that cities face from climate change. This figure captures 2019 CDP cities surveys responses where cities report annual estimated project costs to respond to climate hazards and the sizes in the billions, more than 21 billion collectively to respond to storm and wind hazards, another 12 plus billion USD to respond to extreme precipitation, and a combined more than 5 billion across other risks. This analysis is from 2021 and the cost of, and impact of the hazards is only rising. And then finally, in this context of high climate risks facing cities and broadly insufficient global adaptation finance, we've tracked urban specific adaptation finance and find that current flows are just a fraction of what is needed to respond to the risks. This analysis is a few years old. New analysis of urban adaptation finance flows is actually coming from CPI and CCFLA in June of this year. So you can look for that. It will be capturing 2018 through 2022 finance flows. But I think the trends indicated here remain. Urban adaptation finance in those years, they, the years captured here was about 5% of total global adaptation. And the piece of the figure on the right hand captures distribution of that tracked finance by provider type, where the key lesson I think is that national public FIs in particular provide very little finance in the urban context. This analysis, as well as additional graphs and data analysis is available in a CCFLA publication that happy to share after this webinar. So with that scene set in terms of current, the, the current relatively limited picture of finance flows to urban adaptation, I will flag a couple of resources that are available through the city's Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, CCFLA, to help address this gap. So first, some very brief background on CCFLA. The city's Climate Finance Leadership Alliance is a coalition of leaders committed to deploying finance for city level climate action at scale by 2030. The Alliance serves as the only multi-level, multi-stakeholder coalition aimed at closing the investment gap for urban and subnational climate projects and infrastructure worldwide. The Alliance brings together leaders from over 80 member institutions, I will flag, including UNDP and UN Habitat, across demand institutions, including city and subnational governments and global city networks, finance supply, public and private financial institutions, enablers, including the UN system, research, academia, NGOs, and foundations, and then national governments and policymakers. And CCFLA's work is cross-cutting, and the Alliance engages in many areas to support closing that gap on urban climate finance illustrated by the data analysis captured earlier. These core activities of CCFLA are centered around improving project preparation, a topic I'll revisit in a couple of slides to capture tools in this space, promoting local efforts, tracking urban climate finance, a work stream that has yielded the analysis presented in the prior slides and that will yield the update on urban adaptation finance tracked in June of this year, um, centralizing information and then deep dives on particular topics. From these work areas, CCFLA have produced, has produced a number of outputs and tools that I'll highlight here in the hopes that they're useful for folks on this call. The first of these is a financial instruments toolkit, which captures innovative financial strategies that can help cities overcome the multiple barriers they face in accessing climate finance. The toolkit showcases potential financial instruments, highlighting case studies, and demonstrating practical applications of the instruments in the field. The web page, which is linked at the bottom, is divided into two main parts, the financial instruments library, which presents different financial instruments available for urban climate projects, and then financial instrument case studies repository which provides examples of successful financial instrument implementation. There are a number of adaptation relevant instruments highlighted across these instrument types captured here with the, the small colored dots. The second tool that I'll capture is the Project Preparation Resource Directory. This is an op open online global directory of project preparation facilities designed to help subnational governments and stakeholders find financial and technical support to develop green and resilient infrastructure in their cities. The project preparation resources captured here are just a sample of those included in the directory, which provides information on criteria for engagement, the kind of support offered by the resource, project stage, targeted, application process details as relevant and relevant contact information. And as with the prior tool, um, some of these are focused either just on adaptation or have adaptation as a core component of the project preparation. 
And then finally, in terms of resources and tools available from CCFLA, we'll just highlight a number of publications that may be of interest. There are a set of explanatory briefs on what is project preparation, what is bankability, and what is a project preparation facility. And then there are also a set of reports on financial aggregation for cities, on practical approaches for greening city budgets, and then the analysis of urban climate adaptation finance on the right, from which many of the earlier figure, figures were taken. And to close, I will offer one example of a financial instrument in the urban adaptation space that I think holds great potential, and which hopefully will be a good transition to the next speaker from UN Capital Development Fund. SILRIF, Climate Insurance Linked Resilient Infrastructure Finance, is a long-term insurance solution for cities that's deployed in tandem with a financing facility that creates financial incentives and capacity for, for municipalities to invest in resilient infrastructure. SORIF aims to enable cities to access affordable decade or longer fixed price climate insurance with prearranged premiums contingent on the city's commitment to invest in climate resilience. It undertakes the first market-led pricing of resilience by insurers and investors through the discounts that cities receive on their insurance premiums after making verified investments in resilience. It will incentivize resilience building through those results-based premium payments and funding through the financing facility. The development of SILRIF to date has been driven by a working group of individuals representing a range of stakeholders convened by UN Capital Development Fund with aims to respond to challenges to date around lack of liquidity in response to crises, budget reallocation needs, lack of access to financing, and the broad limitations in investment to resilience that we'll discuss today. So it was a great example of the work being done across lots of institutions to bridge key financing gaps and to mobilize much needed capital to urban adaptation finance. So I'll leave it there with a helpful or a, a sort of hopeful example and happy to answer questions in the chat and to be part of the discussion going forward. Thank you. Great, thank you, Morgan. And uh, in full disclosure, we asked you to cover an immense amount of information in only eight minutes. So thank you so much for, for sticking to the timeline. Uh, there was a lot of food food for thought there, much too much information to cover, um, but uh, please take a look at everybody on, on the call uh, at the presentation, which has a lot of links and to everything that Morgan was just talking about. Um, I'd like to next uh, uh, introduce our next speaker, Sophie DeConnick. She is the manager of the Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility, or LOCAL, at the UN Capital Development Fund. Sophie brings 20 years of experience in international development, environment, and climate change, uh, having worked previously for EU, UNEP, and various ministries in her native Belgium and in the private sector. She'll be discussing today uh, financially-led um, adaptation from U the UNCDF perspective, including experiences and emerging best practices, I mean, good practices, as well as a uh, discussion on performance-based climate resilient grants. And with that, I'm happy to turn over to Sophie. The microphone's yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. And thank you to UNDP and UN Habitat for the opportunity to, to be with you. I'm going to try to um, put the slide mode. Uh, for some reason, I I am stuck. So just give me one second, please, um, as the Zoom is just hiding. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just make it bigger. Let me know if that's okay or or not. Um, do you see the screen? Sorry, you'll see a bit of the slide on the side. Uh, perhaps I'll manage. Well, I don't want to use the time, so I'll just start if you don't mind. And in the meantime, as the Zoom bar is uh, moving, I'll put the, the slide mode. So my name is Sophie de Koning. Uh, I I'm with the UNCDF. I manage the local climate adaptive li living facility. And I would like you to move with me to rural areas. I mean, we will hear about cities and it's extremely important. We're also interested at UNCDF in seeing how we can also reach um, population in the rural areas in terms of addressing climate change adaptation. So here is Sarata Sise from a remote ward in the Gambia, Pakali. Uh, and Sarata has been working with us, with her local government, the ward, uh, to actually decide on some investment for adaptation that meets her needs and the needs of her family. Uh, choosing the investment, also building, earning, earning a bit of money on the side, getting a bit of other support and actually becoming a local adaptation champion. So the question for us is how do we reach, you know, more Sarati Sese, more people in, you know, across the world in rural areas. And for that purpose, about a decade ago, UNCDF has started working um, 
on designing this local climate adaptive living facility, a long acronym for a mechanism that is actually meant to support the financing of locally led adaptation, enabling local governments and their people, uh, like the various partner uh, beneficiaries that you will see throughout the slides in localizing the price agreement, the NDC, the NAP. So as we work uh, with them, um, we do partner with local governments, with communities and with central government in helping them access uh, and effectively use um, climate finance at the local level. So the way we work is rather through promoting the integration of climate change in their planning and budgeting system. We think it is important in order to um, ensure uh, some systemic change rather than using a more traditional project approach. And we use an instrument that has been named performance-based climate resilience grants, uh, which can guarantee the channeling of the funds, but also the programming and the verification of the use of the finance for um, additional responses to the climate risks. So the way it works and um, is that we, we do partner, like I said, with central government, local governments, and then the community. So at central government level, we do work with ministries of finance, uh, ministries of um, in charge of climate change, ministries in charge of local governments, and we design with them a form of intergovernmental inter fiscal transfer system, a dedicated climate window, which is this um, green box that you see here. It is this performance-based climate re resilience grants, which is calculated to come in addition to other grant allocation that the local governments might get. Now, it is important um, for us that uh, it is you know, additional. So it's a dedicated window, but it can be used in conjunction with other transfers. And it's calculated in a way that it's big enough to uh, you know, address the climate risk, but small enough that it doesn't start substituting for development finance, and also that it's scalable and um, therefore can reach more, more people. Um, like other performance-based grants, the local governments has, have to meet certain minimum conditions to ac access the grants. It is very important to guarantee the um, to guarantee the good use of the funds uh, in terms of you know fiduciary risk management as well. To also guarantee some um, basic capacities that the local governments uh, have to use uh, those funds together with the population. They also invited to work towards certain performance measures. Um, so that they somehow start being incentivized in using the other resources uh, in a better way in terms of involving the population, but also in terms of um, shifting their own operations towards you know, more climate compatible development. Every year, the local governments are assessed in a third party neutral manner, and the results feed back into a formula that is behind that green box. So if you perform better, um, as a local government, you will get a slightly bigger grant according to a transparent allocation formula or slightly lower grant. And importantly, the annual performance assessment results will um, uh, be there to inform the capacity building technical support that local governments, population and central government receive to accompany the system. Now, first, it's important to use this system, uh, a system like this, because that's what makes it scalable. So it's possible to reach uh, more and more local governments, more and more people. So in the case of the Gambia, to go back to Sarah Tassisi, the system is currently operating in 32 wards of the country. So already a decent footprint for the country, perhaps 25% or so of the local governments. Um, and the use of the fund can be, the, the funds can be used for different uh, sectors. So it can, as long as it's within the mandate of the local governments and also um, uh, addressing uh, climate risk with some form of justification. So that's why uh, in the first picture you saw a, a bridge, but there are also a lot of investment in the field of agriculture, agroforestry, water, uh, and other types of sectors that are within the mandate of local governments and important for the people in terms of building the resilience. Now, without going into the details, just to say that we know that for um, climate finance, I mean, the reporting, the MRV is essential. It's also very important, of course, at the time of planning to reflect, um, you know, about the risks. So there are some methodologies that we've developed with the World Resource Institute to really help 
um, the government, the local governments and the population reflect what are their risks, what are their adaptation priorities, and therefore why choose a certain investment over another uh, in order to um, address their priority risk. So crafting some form of, you know, mini adaptation rationale, being able to track, and through that um, also being able to hold the scrutiny of the climate financiers. Now, this particular methodology started um, in Asia. Um, hopefully, you see on this slide countries. So it started in Bhutan and Cambodia about 12 years ago. Those countries have gone a long way in scaling up, up to 100 gigawatts now in Bhutan, and they're looking at going to more gigawatts, um, which are the lowest level of local governments, and in Cambodia, up to 50 districts with um, a transition to new source of finance. Because what is important with the system is that once it is set up, various partners, various financiers can use it. So countries typically start with, you know, thinking whether it meets their priorities uh, in terms of, you know, um, their NDCs and the NAP. And if they do, then we support them in, in designing the system. So what looking into the, the flow of fund conditions, menu, what type of investment, all the kind of level of details that you saw on that earlier diagram, that is the design. And then we work with them to test it, put a bit of, you know, a couple of grand cycle tests on a small scale, make sure everything works well, learn, refine, and then transition to a bigger footprint, which can be, you know, um, I mentioned 30 dwarfs in the Gambia. It's, I think it's 12 communes now in Niger, 72 union parish in Bangladesh already consolidated consolidating quite a bit in phase two. And then in phase three, the countries go to uh, a, a bigger footprint, but also importantly, the government is driving the access to finance more and more. Um, in Bhutan, the government has scaled up with budget support. Um, they're also now um, working to directly access green climate fund in Benin. In fact, they just did uh, access the green climate fund themselves who are nationally implementing, implementing entity to go to um, 20, 25 communes. And it is essential because adaptation is a long-term endeavor that countries, local governments and communities receive predictable regular finance so that gradually they can address multiple risks, but also learn and consolidate their efforts uh, and address um, the risk from various angles. That's why um, as the system is designed, of course it can be refined through time, but what we typically try and do is to work with the countries through some form of sequencing of aid. So often they start with bilateral support and then gradually uh, they might diversify the source of finance. They can work with multiple partners using the same system. Some countries do that, like Mozambique, five different developed partners use the same system, supporting different provinces and districts. But they also um, are supported in terms of, you know, getting accredited themselves to uh, the climate funds, um, such as GCF, or adaptation fund. And we also see, we'll hear later from uh, the Kenya experience, that instrument of PBCRG is also uh, increasingly looked at by uh, multilateral development bank uh, in various regions. So just to conclude, um, this particular um, uh, instrument uh, was developed together with countries like Benin, Bhutan, Mozambique, uh, documented uh, into an ISO standard 14093, so that it's actually an instrument that is available for, you know, development partners to use. It's also informing some of the UNFCCC bodies to sensitize about the importance of uh, addressing uh, adaptation at the national level, but also show the practical examples and experience of the countries. And it's also presented as a non-market approach under Article 6.8. So the countries govern this instrument uh, in a board that meets once a year, and they kind of, you know, set set the priority. So um, I will conclude here um, and I'm happy to exchange um, with you during the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Sophie. We had a quick question from a colleague in, in Cape Verde. If there are uh, special avenues to uh, for SIDS to receive support um, through uh, through the local program. Can, can you right. just Limit yeah, so so we do we do respond to expression of interest. So essentially, uh, any country that's interested, we do primarily work with LDC states and African nations. Um, so any country interested can contact us, and then we we explore with them uh, whether they are really interested once they know how it works, and then looping those various entities I mentioned, finance, local governments, 
and climate and, and reflect uh, how we could move with them. So that's the way to uh, that we work uh, with countries that are interested. Fantastic. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Sophie. And there'll be more opportunity to uh, uh, ask more questions during our, during our Q&A section. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our third expert panelist, uh, Ms. Azil Abwasba. Azil is the project manager uh, in the City Climate Finance Gap Fund that is jointly managed by GIZ and European Investment Bank. Prior to this, she worked at uh, the German Institute of Deve Development and Sustainability, uh, UN OCHA, and ACTED. Uh, Asil will dive into her work at the Gap Fund, as well as opportunities for cities in advancing urban adaptation. Asil, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, James, and uh, thanks to you, NDP and UN Habitat for having us here. I'm very happy um, to be presenting the Gap Fund to you today. Uh, my name is Asil Abbasba, and I'm a project manager at the Gap Fund. Um, the main objective of the Gap Fund um, is actually to support cities to get a step closer um, to climate finance. Um, so I'm not so sure if you could share my slides. Um, seven. We don't see it yet. Oh, it's coming, right? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. All right, so um, before uh, getting into the details of what the GAP Fund is, you might be wondering what is actually the GAP. Um, so as uh, mentioned by uh, the speakers earlier and the panelists at the beginning, that um, there are immense needs um, for um, climate finance, uh, potentially also over uh, 90 uh, uh, US dollars, uh, trillions uh, in need for um, climate finance. And at the same time, we see that there is um, there, that uh, many MDBs and international financial institutions are uh, raising their uh, commitments um, for climate. Um, at the same time, uh, we have investors who are uh, ready uh, with capital to invest in climate uh, projects um, and also cities that have a demand for financing um, solutions. At the same time, as mentioned by many speakers, we do not yet see um, um, cities or subnational um, entities being able to access climate finance. Um, and here we always hear um, um, that there are there is money, but there are no good projects. And this is what this is a challenge that the GAF fund is trying to really address. Uh, we support cities with um, early stage project preparation, which is often very difficult to finance. Um, please next uh, slide, please. So a little bit more about the GAF fund. Um, so we are a multi-donor trust fund. Um, it is managed by the World Bank and the European Investment uh, Bank, and GIZ is the implementing partner of EIB. Um, it is funded by the um, German government and the government of Luxembourg, and we have many partners, uh, um, such as um, City Networks, and we're also, of course, um, uh, part of uh, CCFLA. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what do we actually do at the GAP Fund? As mentioned earlier, uh, we do a lot of, we support cities with early stage project preparation. Here in the slide, you see the project preparation um, cycle. It starts with planning, strategy development, project definition, pre-feasibility, and then goes into the feasibility, so more technical, detailed studies, and later um, the actual investment, and later the implementation, and later the M&E, et cetera. So at the GAP Fund, we actually support early stage project preparation. So we support in, uh, we support cities in financing um, to develop their strategies and, and, and planning, and also uh, particular project definition and pre-feasibility studies work. Oftentimes, as I mentioned, cities struggle a lot to finance this aspect um, of project preparation simply because financiers are not really yet sure if they would be financing this project. So they're less likely to really invest in early stage project uh, preparation. So please, next slide. So what do we actually really offer in more detail? So we support, again, climate strategy development. Um, so climate plans, green action plans of, of, of cities. Uh, we also um, support with um, identifying capacity development ne needs for project preparation at the city level. Uh, we support with prioritization of investments as part of the climate strategy or investment program if cities have already developed it. Um, we also have... Um, we help in defining project concepts and also um, provide also matchmaking and additional support to cities once the pre-feasibility study is, is done. Next slide, please. 
So you might be wondering right now for those uh, in the audience whether uh, you would be able to access uh, GAP fund support. Um, we, we basically have, uh, we accept applications from countries in emerging and developing economies. So all countries mentioned in the OECD deck list. Important for us that um, the application actually comes from the city itself. So it cannot come from a private sector or a nonprofit entity, it has to come from the city administration or um, the state administration. Um, also important for us that this is a climate project. So it has to be either adaptation or mitigation. In this case here in this webinar, we're interested in adaptation projects. Um, it has to be an urban project. So it has to be in the, in the city. Um, um, and it has to be early stage project preparation. And that means that it cannot really be a feasibility study, but rather really a plan or a project definition or conceptualization. And in terms of the sectors, of course, the green infrastructure adaptation and BS, but also if you are also interested in other sectors, we have energy waste, uh, water and, um, and mobility. Um, so this is just a slide to showcase uh, where we are operating right now in the GAP Fund. Um, so far, we have approved 44 technical assistance assignments. You can see we have a very large widespread. And um, um, just in terms of um, the sector, a sectoral spread, um, I would say that actually adaptation has been quite uh, high on demand uh, by the city. So this is great news as well. Um, initially, at the GAP Fund, we expected to have more mitigation projects, but uh, actually we have a lot of uh, cities requiring and requesting adaptation projects and green infrastructure projects. Um, actually, about 21% of all projects that have been approved are um, in NBS and adaptation. And as you can see, we have quite a geographical spread um, in terms of uh, potentially actually for adaptation projects, we have received quite a lot from Latin America, but uh, increasingly also from Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Next slide, please. So just uh, a few examples of NBS projects that we have um, approved and finalized. We have a greening of urban areas um, in Venezia, in Ukraine. We have also done a pre-feasibility study on Campinas a Linear Park in Brazil. Um, another urban forest project in Santa Marta, Colombia, and a resilient water uh, management program in Cuenca, Ecuador. And I believe time allows, so I just want to give you a little bit of a taste of what a pre-feasibility study is in adaptation finance um, and what this really actually entails. So we have, I have this, um, this example here from Fiji. Um, and um, the city of Savasavo applied for the GAP fund for a pre with the study on coastal protection. Uh, and the objectives were basically to conduct a coastal risk assessment, to identify the areas that are um, at high exposure to natural disaster hazards, um, also to identify tailored NBS coastal protection measures for Savasavo, including preliminary financial and economic analysis, but also identifying the financial pathway and funding um, analysis of the co-benefits of this coastal protection program, also uh, reporting on the ownership, maintenance structure, and also recommendations for upscaling, which is very important for adaptation projects, as, as you know. Um, I'm not so sure if I have enough time, but I will go. Uh, the study has not been finalized, but I want to give you a little bit of a taste of what we actually do. Here, you could see that uh, we have a coastal hazard house, hotspot map where we really, this is the shoreline of Savu Savu, the city, and we really go into detail to really identify where are, um, you know, the main um, hazardous spots. Next slide, please. And as part of the analysis, we also look at what are the existing coastal protection measures that are not necessarily actually uh, nature-based solutions or adaptation measures. Sometimes there are gray measures uh, that have already been there in place, but uh, as part of the analysis, it's important to also um, identify those. And then the last slide, please. Yes, so as part of the study also, um, we are proposing basically um, some hybrid NBS measures um, as you can see here, the, the shoreline is quite eroded and you can see that the main actually uh, street of the city is very close to the shoreline. And oftentimes when there's sea level rise or there's storm surges, et cetera, the main street is flooded in the city. Residents are unable, you know, they're disconnected in the city. And so as part of the city, we are providing uh, proposed adaptation interventions. Um, the next stage is not yet finalized. We'll do some costing of those economic cost benefit analysis and also recommendations for scaling up um, in other cities in, in Fiji. I'll end it here and happy to answer any questions in, in the later in the Q&A. Thank you so much.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Asil. Uh, we're running a little bit late in time. I, I welcome every, uh, the participants to enter their questions in the Q&A. We're trying to get through them as quickly as possible. And now for review in the country experiences, I will hand over the microphone to my colleague, Muyeye. Cheers. Sorry, the mute is still on. There you go. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, James, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I'd like to welcome you to part two of our webinar today. And I see that we have got a lot of uh, colleagues from different parts of the world, different cities and uh, communities. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. My name is Muyeye Shamwera. I work for UNDP uh, as Regional Technical Advisor on Climate Change Adaptation. I'm based in the regional hub in uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and uh, I'm part of the climate change adaptation team uh, globally, uh, which looks at uh, adaptation in a wide range of sectors, uh, including water adaptation, coastal adaptation, uh, urban resilience, uh, agricultural adaptation, uh, value chains, and uh, so on. And uh, urban adaptation is a very critical element of the work uh, that we do. Uh, and uh, we have got a number of uh, initiatives that we're doing, as my colleague Jenny mentioned earlier on in Kazakhstan, in Bhutan. Uh, we also have got work in uh, Liberia the, on uh, urban adaptation. Uh, we have got work in uh, Nigeria and uh, so many other places. And uh, our focus on urban resilience is uh, increasing uh, quite a lot. And um, as uh, part two of uh, this webinar, we really want to look at, uh, to get some experiences from colleagues who are working uh, on adaptation uh, finance at the sub-national level. And we have got uh, uh, an impressive uh, set of speakers from uh, Kenya, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, Rwanda. And uh, I will introduce them uh, shortly. Uh, by way of uh, housekeeping, I would like to invite participants in this webinar to also share your experiences in the uh, chat box uh, in as much as you also uh, ask questions to the panelists. And uh, my, my, it is my pleasure to welcome Peter Odenga, Shamim uh, Aranipa from Bangladesh, uh, and uh, my colleague Basil from uh, Rwanda. The first one to speak would be uh, Peter Odengo, who is a senior policy advisor on climate finance and uh, green economy at the National Treasury uh, of Kenya, uh, and also a team leader for the strategic environment assessment and land uh, use planning unit for the sustainable management of deltas in Kenya. He is the founder of the Greening Kenya Initiative Trust and a former advisor to the Prime Minister of Kenya. And uh, Peter has got more than 15 years uh, of experience in climate finance matters and uh, public policy. Uh, because we don't have uh, much time, I'll ask uh, the speakers to try and fit uh, their presentations uh, within five minutes so that we can have some time to uh, uh, have discussions. Uh, Peter, you're welcome to share your experiences. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Very clear. Hello. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much, colleague. I know five minutes is very small, uh, it's, it's, it's short, but uh, let me also highlight that I'm also the program coordinator for the Pioneer Financing Locally Led Climate Action called the FLOCA program, which, is, which has been designed here in Kenya since 2019. So what I want to, uh, to share with the team is the challenges, opportunities, and uh, where we are today. When we designed this program, there has been a, a serious call that Africa has not been accessing climate finance in scale and the difficulty in getting, uh, in, in, in mobilizing climate finance. But even the little of 4% that has, be, uh, that has been mobilized has never reached the, where it is supposed to be uh, needed. That is the front line in the village where the households are being affected. It is upon this background that in 2011, Kenya decided to pilot what we call 
uh, financing locally led climate action at the local level. And in Kenya, we have uh, two types of uh, government, national and uh, county government, which is in the global perspective called subnational. So in 2019, from 2013 to, 20, uh, to 2022, we only had five counties, counties subnational, which had already established their climate finance. But when Floca came into being, it, it we catalyzed the formation of one, uh, we conducted what is called a baseline assessment. And within the baseline assessment, we found that only five counties or uh, then were having Climate Change Act because nationally in Kenya, we had, uh, we had enacted our Climate Change Act in 2016. But that act requires that all subnationals also enact all domestic, domestic uh, domesticate the national policies, legislative frameworks, and strategies at their local level so that they address the local challenges. So I when, yes. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Uh, do you mind turning on your mic, your uh, video, please? Uh, well, I don't mind. I don't mind, but I'm in a very dark place in somewhere in the in the rural because this is responding to my mother's challenge. I hope you can see. So we can figure that's really great. Oh, great! So within that time, then we had only five. But by the time Flocker came into being, with the analysis, by 2021, 20, by 2022. 45 counties have already developed their own climate change act, uh, act, climate finance policy, climate change policy, and already established climate change uh, units at the local level, because we work from national, subnational, and then to world level. And then all that, uh, after establishing that, then Floca we had uh, to mobilize uh, climate finance in scale, where World Bank uh, committed $150 million, uh, Previously, uh, then Daneda also committed $8.9 million, CEDA $14.4 million. That one, were, and then the government of Kenya National Treasury, where the program is domiciled, also committed $5 million for a five-year period. In order to catalyze the action and contribute uh, as a contributory scheme, all the 47 subnational also were required under the P4R progress for result to commit at least 1.5% of their own development, uh, development budget. And to date, as I'm talking here, I'm in a place called Naivasa, where now Floca is now reviewing it. All the 47 counties committed uh, $75 million over a five year period. So, totally, as we are, as we are talking now, Loka has mobilized $295 million. And of these $295 million, it is 89% uh, of it is being channeled through 1,450 wards in all the 47 counties in Kenya. And the ward is the lowest level administration unit where from the ward now you go into the villages and in villages you go into household. But how do we then move the money uh, from this fund, this fund? Well, first, Flock has got two types of fund. County climate institutional support uh, grant. That institutional support grant is sometimes traditionally called TA, technical assistance. So within that fund, each county, each, each county is uh, entitled 100,000 US dollars per year for three years. And the purpose of that money is to strengthen the capacity of those people in the local county climate change units which have been formed to enable them move this money and identify adapt adaptation and resilient type of projects that can be built. Then it was believed that after three years, then these units at the lower level shall have already strengthened their capacity and now able to pick up the second bigger grant. The second bigger grant is called County Climate Resilient Investment Grant. Now that County Climate Resilient Invest is Investment Grant is each county subnational is entitled to one average of $1.25 million per year for the next four years. So that sorted out what is called the ease of access, predictability, and the sustainability of that farm. But now Floca, which is now being implemented, is a small Floca. The bigger Floca, which had already been approved by the government, is 1.05 billion US dollars for a period of five years. So the money is in that kit. Then within that now, all the 
villagers, all the households are required to undertake what we call participatory, rural, participatory climate risk assessment. It is that risk assessment which informs the vulnerability within the locality, and that is now what we use in a formula to calculate how much each county and each village and each project is getting. But what are the projects which are prioritized under this process? It, the major one are uh, agriculture, water, or uh, natural resources, land degradation, which now takes almost more than 80% of the total uh, funds in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the kitty. 20%, which now remains, is now used for relative mitigating uh, mitigative aspects, for example, provision of clean energy at the household level. But who are our partners? This is coordinated by the National Treasury, where I sit, is where the PIU is. Then it, a technical, uh, which deals with the money mobilization and setting it up and making sure that the money reaches to the all partners. Then the technical support is provided by our Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. Then the skilled uh, climate data is provided by Kenya Meteorological Department. But for the subnational, all the coordination is done by what we call County uh, Council of Governors. And at the Thank local you. level, yeah. If you could yes. now wind, wind up, please. Thank you. Great. But now when the money goes in, then as we are talking now, we have all 45 county climate change. Uh, all the policies have been done. Several training has been uh, has been done to all this. Uh, next week, we are releasing $60 million to 45 counties with an average from about $800,000 now to $3, uh, to $3 million. And... Uh, after next week, now the real implementation of the building of the resilience within the community in scale is starting in earnest. So thank you. I hope I will get another day to share more details on this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really impressive. And uh, if you look into the chat box, you already start seeing uh, uh, some uh, comments and questions, and uh, you could start uh, addressing them before we come back to uh, you to answer some of them. Uh, and uh, we would like to uh, move on now uh, with our second speaker, who is from Bangladesh, uh, Shamim. And uh, Shamim Aranipa is uh, the Deputy Secretary in the Ministry of Public Administration uh, to the Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. Uh, prior to her role in the ministry, uh, Shamim served as an adaptation innovation specialist at uh, UNDP, where she was involved in establishing uh, 247 climate smart green cooperatives in Bangladesh's uh, most vulnerable uh, uh, districts. And uh, we are delighted to have you, Shamim, to share your experiences and uh, over to you. Thank you, Milani, for your nice introduction. And a very good day to everyone who have joined in today's webinar. Um, I'm Shami Maranipa, and I'm from Bangladesh to share the adaptation financing experience from there. Being a government official of Bangladesh, I have had the opportunity to work with the different capacities of the local government. And in addition, I have also have work experience with the UNDP Bangladesh as an adaptation innovation expert. So I'll try to share my experience from the both fields. And in my speech, I'll try to highlight the main three issues. Firstly, uh, what has been highlighted in our national adaptation financing strategy in our country, what we are practicing in the subnational level and the unique outcome we are experiencing through this uh, innovative adaptation uh, financing. So here I have some slides to share with you. I hope it's visible to everyone, is it? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay, thank you. So as I said, that I'll share the national level adaptation financing strategy of our country. So here you can see 
the core objectives of our national adaptation plan of Bangladesh. And you can see here, and the one of the core objectives is sustainable financing. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, and I'm very happy to share that we have developed our, according to the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, we have developed our national adaptation plan already. Uh, from uh, It will be implemented from 2023 up to 2050. So how we, uh, and after fixing this priority of sustainable financing, we developed a detailed strategy that how we are going to achieve it. Uh, here I have highlighted some of the points um, we um, uh, we shared and only outlined to achieve the sustainable financing. So, uh, first of all, the climate financing sources, uh, which source will be used for our adaptation strategy. Uh, next, the uh, exploring the different innovative financing like insurance for climate risk management, green bonds, public-private partnership like this and policy reform to engage all the stakeholders and the private sector management. And lastly, uh, assigning these supervisory roles to oversee all of these uh, climate financing issues. And we um, assigned the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and the Economic Relation Division to oversee the overall climate financing. So it was all about the national level overarching strategy for our climate adaptation financing now come to the local level. Um, in case of Bangladesh, climate change adaptation already falls within the scope of the inherent capacity responsibilities of our local governments. So they are already doing this in different uh, capacities, uh, but uh, the current scenario of climate risks or adversity, these things are new to them. And uh, the, as the very closest administrative unit to the community, they already have the legitimacy to mobilize the finance and conveying the power to coordinate co-finance and engage with the stakeholders, including our national institution and uh, also the private sectors. So as uh, I was saying that I'll also share the sub-national level financing model we are already practicing. I think Sophie already uh, elaborate the performance-based climate resilient grant in her um, space. So it's the same thing we are practicing in Bangladesh. Uh, in addition to annual development budget, we are just uh, adding another performance-based climate resilient grant. And here we are giving uh, the support to the local government institution to plan, design, and implement those climate adaptive um, projects. So here we have introduced a new instrument that how we are going to allocate the budget to the local government institution uh, by ensuring the equity and justice so that most climate vulnerable local government institution can, can have their right share. So we currently developed a climate vulnerability index uh, up to the lowest star of local government to map the most climate vulnerable communities and advocate for increased funding allocation to build their resilience. And the CVI, Climate Vulnerability Index, is enabling our government to create a national database regarding national climate vulnerability and adaptive capacities, which can be used for climate vulnerability based development budget allocation in the local government institution. As I said, I also have the work experience with the local government institutions of Bangladesh. So, what uh, we, we what we used to practice that we considered three uh, issues uh, like population area and backwardness of a particular area to give them any climate uh, any budget development budget or any other budget but in addition to that three indicators we are also adding one more indicator that is climate vulnerability indicators so it will ensure more equitable uh, distribution of budget and it will make a more inclusive society in terms of um, development and other forwardness. So another source of climate financing model we are practicing, as I said, at first we are providing our um, a grant to the local government institution to capacitate them to take uh, the climate uh, adaptive projects. Here we are also practicing 
that we are providing the micro grant directly to the climate vulnerable people, uh, particularly women in climate vulnerable areas. And we are providing them the uh, capacity and we are doing handholding so that they can diversify their livelihood options. Uh, mostly the climate resilient driving option. And here we are also engaging other NGOs and local uh, stakeholders so can they can engage in this platform to capacitate those uh, climate vulnerable community. And here one more very uh, innovative in in initiative I want to mention here that we have found that after providing the micro grant, uh, more than 70% of the groups, they are in a profitable position. Uh, in their livelihood initiatives. So to make this initiative more sustainable after the project initiative, we uh, established uh, climate smart cooperatives uh, where the uh, beneficiaries are the shareholders. And through these cooperatives, climate vulnerable households can establish green businesses with trade licenses and access financial instruments to formal banking channels. And the capital uh, for formal banking channels and the capital market more easily, and enabling them to scale up their investment from a very incremental approach to a transformative uh, adaptation approach. Uh, Shamim, uh, I'm sorry for uh, cutting you short. Uh, yeah. if you wind up, please. So Thank I'm you. almost in the end of the, my presentation, and here I have outlined the five key uniqueness in our adaptation financing mechanism that we are very much community taking community centered approach and we are tailoring the project to better fit the community. And we are um, doing various sorts of innovative financing mechanism like blending the PBCRG and CRF, CRF schemes. And for ensuring the long-term resilience, we are just making various innovative organizational formats so that it can be sustainable for long run, not for the short term. So for this event, it's uh, all from my side and I'll be happy to have any questions or remarks on my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shamim, for that uh, excellent presentation. Really uh, enjoyable. And uh, I'm sorry for cutting you off uh, short. Thank you so much. Uh, we would like to move on to our next uh, presenter. And uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Basil Karimba, uh, who is uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Green City Kigali, uh, which is Rwanda's uh, pilot on green uh, urbanization. Uh, prior to his role, Basil played an instrumental role in the rehabilitation of the Nyandungu Eco Park. Uh, his uh, professional journey encompasses diverse sectors, including banking, real estate, construction, and uh, landscape restoration, spanning regions across uh, East Africa, Southern Africa, and the Middle East. And it is a pleasure to uh, get uh, his perspectives from uh, Rwanda. And uh, over to you, Basil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Muyeye. I appreciate the invitation by UNDP and UN Habitat. And uh, I'll set my timer so you don't have to stop me. <laughs> um, yeah, so. My explanation is going to be based on the storyline of what the Green City is trying to achieve. Um, the idea of Green City Kigali really was born by our Rwanda Green Fund, or the government of Rwanda made a decision to uh, build cities or to inform itself about how to urbanize in an African context. So Green City Kigali is addressing challenges around urbanization sustainably. So a location has been selected. Um, it's called Kinyinya Hill. It's a suburb of Kigali city, 15 minutes away out of the city as the location to deliver this uh, idea. Um, we have four goals in this project. Um, affordability is, is a key driver, uh, climate smart, including climate ad adaptation, uh, resource efficiency, and ensuring that with all this innovation, with all these competing dynamics, we are still delivering a solution for, for Rwandans. So cultural sensitivity is our fourth pillar. All these are grounded in the SDGs. And for today's discussion, really, we will focus more on the adaptation opportunities that are in this uh, master plan. 
So our work starts off working very closely with the city of Kigali. Um, everything we're doing is informed by the policy framework of the government, Vision 2050, the Green Growth um, Climate Resilient Strategy, uh, the urbanization uh, strategy, and uh, so we are grounded in policy. And with that, we have the uh, city of Kigali master plan that is informing our effort at master plan level of this Kenya Hill. All that grounding now takes us to the micro level of the master plan and how we are achieving these ideas. So in focusing more on the adaptation initiatives within this master plan, we have many opportunities for adaptation. Uh, in fact, the neighborhoods and how they've been subdivided are the boundaries have been set with what we are calling green fingers that are mechanisms for nature-based stormwater management. Again, with the element of efficiency, these areas that are about uh, 30 meters wide can perform, can provide spaces for urban agriculture and for recreation. This accounts for about um, a, a huge percentage of the site. Again, ensuring that the adaptive capacity of a green city is emphasized through these mechanisms. At the same time, we have an opportunity for a, an eco park in this, at the center of this city. We already have an implementation around the city that has given an example of how this place could be developed sustainably commercially as well. All this we're trying to deliver. We have a first stage project. We are trying to deliver it in a triple P uh, private public partnership model where this SPV that's been set up by the Rwanda Green Fund has received a grant support from the German government, already a commitment of about 40 million euro for studies and for infrastructure subsidy on our first stage project of 16 hectares, where we plan to deliver 2000 houses. Now, what is the ecosystem that has enabled us to reach this stage? We are, uh, because we are a catalytic project and a pilot engineered by our Rwanda Green Fund, a, an institution that is raising climate finance, but not stopping there and going ahead to trigger a pipeline. So the green city comes in again through the instruments like what you're seeing on the screen now, uh, targeted to the public sector and the private sector. We have an Inego facility that is an implementation tied into the NDCs and we have Ireme Invest that is targeted to the private sector. In our triple P model, the city government can leverage Inego and our private developers that we want to work with can work with Ireme. At the same time, there are some success stories already for us to, to look at and take stock. We have Green Jichumbi funded by GCF in a rural setting that is very strong on adaptation and that is uh, drawing down. But at the same time, it has brought up an idea for uh, what we, for the community adaptation facility, again, engineered by the Green Fund, that is taking that has is now working on the ground prepared by a Jichumbi project. Nyandungu Eco Park is another adaptation where a wetland, a degraded space, is now running sustainably, funded by uh, the Rwanda Green Fund. It's now providing a blueprint on which to, to develop other green uh, wetlands within Kigali. So by that storyline, we can now understand uh, how uh, Rwanda is using uh, financing or the financing tools that have been engineered around uh, adaptation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Basil. Those are very practical examples and uh, the models that uh, you're using to finance adaptation at the local level in a highly integrated manner and great to see some uh, ecosystem based approaches as well and uh, colleagues uh, this brings us to the end of our uh, presentations uh, we still have got nine minutes which is not a lot for us to get into detailed discussions uh, in the process of uh, the presentations uh, we have had a few questions that were raised uh, to some to some of our panelists we also have got three hands that have been 
raised. So I would like to uh, ask specifically, uh, Peter, a, a question was raised to you on how to get access to information on the great case study that you have shared and uh, how it can be scaled up. And uh, to uh, Asil, who presented uh, earlier on, uh, there is a question on the GAP Fund uh, on what are some of the best practices uh, and uh, significant challenges that you've encountered from your previous work, especially in least developed countries, and uh, if you've got any experiences from uh, Southern Africa. And before I give you, because we don't have much time, before I give you, uh, uh, you know, the microphone, I'd like to ask a, the four colleagues uh, to ask their questions who are uh, raising their hands very, very briefly and to the point so that our panelists can all answer them uh, at the same time. If possible, if you could indicate which panelists you are addressing your question to. Uh, first of all, we have got uh, a Lux Minarian. Uh, Nayak, uh, and then we go to Golivat and uh, Adekambi and uh, Igwe Bukile. So, uh, yeah, so the first two hands have been uh, cancelled. So Adekambi, Pascal, and uh, Igwe Bukile, uh, if you could uh, please uh, uh, ask your questions, and then we go to the panelists. Thank you. Hello, yeah, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Yes, good afternoon. Um, okay, so my name is Igwe Bike Ijoma. Um, uh, I sit on the board of Climate Strategies and um, I also run a consultancy based in Abuja here um, uh, that deals with adaptation and uh, mitigation uh, and decarbonization and handholding um, advisory. And we've been on this in the last 15 years. And the issue mainly here is that, uh, and this is a general uh, comment in terms of the, the reason why we are having very low uh, climate finance or climate investment coming into Africa. I'm, I'm talking and speaking from our experience from the African perspective. So uh, I think we need a new business model to deliver uh, both these projects and also um, uh, to ramp up adaptation financing, you know, across board. Uh, the PPP that, um, you know, the last presenter uh, made, uh, proposed, or, you know, the model they are using to develop the green city, I'm not sure that it has delivered enough uh, benefits, right? Because uh, we know that uh, public sector actors and private, their private sector interests sometimes, right, you know, collaborate to hijack some of these projects and they also collaborate to hijack some of the benefits. And what we are proposing, and we are working on, you know, on, um, on the concept notes uh, with uh, um, climate strategies, you know, focused on the subnational government. What we are proposing is a new business model that integrates these communities as part of the asset owners. Right, so um, the investment is done, and then um, entities coming into communities set up projects, and then the communities feel alienated. So we have a new business model that looks at integrating those communities as part owners of those projects, and this is also one of the things or one of the factors that will ensure sustainability you know, uh, beyond the, the, the uh, uh, investment. Because when these communities own these projects, whether it's at the local level or community level or at the local government level or at the subnational level, when they take ownership of these projects, then success is guaranteed. And again, I'm, I'm happy that we are talking about um, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, zooming in on the subnational government level which is actually what the proposal that we are working on, the concept note we are working on, uh, is actually looking at because for too long, we have focused so much on the national government. And working Thanks, uh, at this... Uh, okay. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Uh, we have very little time left. Really uh, critical contribution. And I would like to re request you uh, to uh, probably share some of these reflections in the chat box and also your email address because this is of very great interest to us. Uh, let me bring in uh, uh, 
Adekambi uh, to ask a question very briefly. Uh, we have got only uh, less than five minutes left. Adekambi, over to you. Uh, you are muted. Right. Perhaps we move to the next. Yeah, person. let's move to the next. Uh, Nayak, you still have your hand up? No. Uh, colleagues, we have got very little time left, and uh, I'd like us to finish on time. And uh, if you have got uh, uh, points and questions, please uh, write them in the chat box. Uh, for now, I would like to invite um, some of our panelists uh, to answer the questions that have been uh, asked. Uh, uh, first of all, Peter, uh, Asil, and uh, if uh, uh, Basil, especially on PPP, if you want to mention something very briefly. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. In fact, we understand the challenge around PPPs. A lot of uh, material around to show what the, the challenges are. And therefore, the, in our thinking around how to uh, deliver this PPP is, first of all, really to work on the de-risking elements. Um, in our case, for example, commitment by the government of Rwanda and development partners has come, has come in very strongly to enable us to define bankability on our first stage project on, uh, for the 2000 houses. Now, in the wider area where you want the community to come in, um, you have now an opportunity based on the financial instruments that are being engineered by the Rwanda Green Fund for a community level tapping using uh, instruments that are designed to fit within the NDCs where they respond to a call for proposal and they get uh, funding to do that. At the same time, through the IREMA Invest, a private sector facility that has two arms of uh, uh, PPF and a concessional facility through the development bank, it, a private sector developer now has an opportunity to partner with the local community on a green blue network, for example, or on the eco park, for example. So the engineering of these instruments is very understanding of the challenges in the triple uh, P structure. And that's where we see a solution going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Basil. Uh, Peter, over to you. Great. Most of the questions that have been uh, asked have already responded them on the chat, but there are only two questions of access to information on Flocker and how to scale it up. In a second, we are using all government systems means. All the communication to the lowest level is done through, is coordinated through our coordinated framework of Council of Governors. We also use the website. We also have green champions in the villages. We also have WhatsApp so that there is real-time access to this information all through, and they're here, and a, a dashboard is being created for the, for those who are digital to access the information in real time. There is a, a redress, grievance redress mechanism, which we is also developed by all government approach. Now, on, on, on how to scale it up, uh, as I mentioned in the chat, the original uh, Flocka Plus or government Flocka it's a $1.05 billion uh, for a period of five years. 295 is the initial capital. So as we are talking now, we are already in the process. Apart, uh, now we have already accessed RSF, uh, IMF, RSF, Resilience, uh, Resilience Sustainability Facility, 444 million. We are uh, in, the, in the next, in, uh, next month, April, there will be new announcements to the tune of about $5 billion. That's purely for scaling up. So we are mobilizing money from all quarters to make sure that we scale up this one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Asil, less than 30 seconds, please. Yes, thank you so much. Um, in terms of lessons and uh, lessons learned from the adaptation projects that we've implemented, I would say that it's um, ticket size is very important. So scalability of the intervention is very important. And to 
to make sure it is scalable, um, it has to have it has to be a good project, like I mentioned. So it has to really demonstrate that it um, um, that it addresses the adaptation challenge, um, that it also has benefits to the community, to, uh, to the livelihood of the community, and also that it does save on the cost from the losses and damages. Um, of this adaptation um, challenge. These are really important factors. Um, and also community buy-in is very essential as one of the participants also mentioned in terms of adaptation projects. And once these success factors are there, it's easier to really scale up the project and also um, have it be able to access finance too. Thank you so much, uh, Essel, for being so uh, pointed in terms of time and answering. And um, colleagues, I, I hate to say we have come to the end of uh, uh, the webinar because I think there's been uh, quite a lot discussed and still more to be discussed and uh, exciting things coming that have been coming through. Uh, and uh, I would really want to thank everybody for their participation, uh, sharing information, a lot of uh, information sharing, exchange of uh, ideas and contacts uh, going on. I'd like to thank uh, uh, our, uh, our speakers, a, all six of them really excellent uh, and insightful. Like to thank uh, UNDP and uh, UN Habitat for organizing uh, this webinar. And uh, also want to thank my core facilitator, uh, James, uh, for uh, taking us through this process and uh, for our colleagues who are organizing this seminar uh, uh, in the background uh, for this uh, really wonderful webinar. and. Uh, I wish you colleagues all the best and uh, let's continue exchanging information and see you next time. Bye.